uh, very much for the warm welcomes, and it's a pleasure to be here. I have to be honest with you, this is my first HGS uh, event ever, but it, it's a really warm welcome, and it's very happy to be here, so thank you very much. Uh, the presentation that um, I'm going to give, uh, I gave last year at the uh, APG conference, and this is a bit of an expanded uh, version. And what I would say up front is this is not really something uh, at, uh, at ConocoPhillips that we've been working on as a point of active research, but it is something we've been looking at really for a number of years as part of outcrop characterization <coughs> research that we've um, we've been doing. It's, you know, giving this presentation now, sort of searching my soul, it's a extremely high quality sandstone in an anticline. I mean, such a blast from the past. I mean, you guys remember anticlines? It was a, it was a simpler day back then. So I feel a little bit, you know, kind of dated. <laughs> talking about those topics, but um, what it really represents is just a very interesting piece of rock in Wyoming, and it's a, it's a good story to tell. So I've drug a lot of people um, through this process with me, and I'd like to acknowledge, of course, ConocoPhillips Technology and Projects for permission to publish and tolerance of this work that we've done over the years. It's never really been a project of any sort. Uh, J.D. Jameson um, had the initial motivation to do the, the later piece of work on this project. He was at a Hedberg meeting, and I was leading up, and we visited these rocks, and he said, hey, you ought to try this, and we did. And so I owe him that inspiration. Uh, Chris Zahm is my closest um, collaborator on this work. You'll see a lot of his uh, contributions. He's at UT. David Farrell, Alan Morris, Ronald McGinnis, and others um, at Southwest Research. That's a great structural geology consulting group in San Antonio um, that are always ready to solve tough problems. Uh, a couple of folks in ConocoPhillips, Rico Ramos, who did the rock mechanics testing you'll see, and um, my colleague Anita Soma, who uh, worked on the um, petrography and the the diagenetic characterization. Uh, Dick Larice did some of the petrogra petrographic characterization. And then more recently, I've been working with Steve Laubach and Andres Fall at UT to do some of the more advanced petrographic characterization work. And then Kevin's name shows up again down here, because at the end of the talk, if I'm not running really late, I'm going to show you some of the work that he's been doing on geomechanical modeling, which I think represents uh, kind of the future of where this work could go. And the reason why I gave the talk a year ago and why I'm continuing to give it is I'm trying to figure out where this research could go. And, um, and I really don't know. I've kind of reached a bit of a roadblock in terms of what we can do with it now, uh, but I know that it has legs if the right people were consulted. All right, so I'll just run through these things, talk a little bit about the background. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll review the fracture characterization work that we've done in these outcrops. The new work is more down here in the second half the the paragenetic modeling, the rock mechanics work that we've done, and so I'll be focusing more on that after I, I clear the, um, the introduction. So the purpose of this research really is to understand that there is, an, is a link between measures of cumulative deformation at the reservoir scale and the degree of quartz cementation that might allow for predictions of reservoir quality changes that might attend deformation. And so to, to apply this in the subsurface, we have to integrate across um, you know, good structural geology and analysis, understanding what's going on with the, the reservoir itself, maybe translating that into geomechanical modeling in order to get predictive about it, and then finally to understand how cementation kinetics and changes to reservoir quality can be married within that, within that context. So it's about structural geology and characterization, understanding what's going on at the reservoir scale, and then what on earth can we do in terms of uh, a prediction. All right, so the, um, the outcrops I'm going to talk about are from central Wyoming, and um, it, they involve the Pennsylvanian 10 sleep sandstone. And it, it, I'm sure you've all either been on this 10 sleep on outcrop or certainly heard about it from its petroleum characteristics because um, historically the 10 sleep 
has provided the highest quality oil producing reservoirs in the Laramide Rockies petroleum system. And then zooming in from that view to um, the state of Wyoming in the northwest corner of Wyoming in basins such as the um, Powder River Basin, the Bighorn Basin, or the Wind River Basin, and then zooming again, and these blue blobs represent productive, tensely oil fields generally arranged around the periphery of some of these structurally controlled basins. And the Tensley has um, produced something on the order of uh, 2.5 billion barrels of oil um, within the confines of that map on the, the previous slide. And uh, as of yesterday, from the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, these are all the fields producing in Wyoming that have tensely production of some sort, or some of the other equivalents, um, like the weaver or the minnow loose or the quadrant and other, other equivalent formations. And so there have been about 6,000 wells that have been drilled into the Tensley, and a third of those are, um, are still producing today. And that, that exploration and production began in the early part of the, uh, of the 19th, uh, 20th century. And there are some notable fields, such as uh, Elk Basin on the Wyoming-Montana border, which has produced um, nearly uh, 600 million barrels. Oregon Basin outside of Cody, Wyoming, uh, another half a billion barrels. And so those are some of the most notable fields that represent um, structural traps. And the structural traps in the, in the region, most of these red dots were discovered by surface geology back in the teens and the, and the 20s. And then later, um, with additional exploration concepts, um, stratigraphic traps such as Cottonwood Creek of the Tensley were also discovered. So these fields together, um, in their heyday in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and then digital records are available from the 70s and on, collectively, contributed uh, on the order of 150 million barrels of, uh, of liquids production to Wyoming annually. Really incredible, incredibly productive reservoir system. The Ten Sleep Sandstone is uh, Pennsylvanian, and it's about, in our area anyway, 120 meters thick of dominantly Aeolian sand in the upper three quarters of it or so, and then it turns into limestones and dolomitic sandstones and dolomites more towards the base. In the upper part, it just has fantastic Aeolian and inner dune type facies. From uh, Ron Blakey's compilation, here is the, his uh, Pennsylvanian time slice, and it shows the uh, western edge of North America in a platformal configuration with the Appalachian orogeny uh, on the other side of the tectonic plate, and then the ancestral Rockies active to the south, dominating the tectonic architecture. From a depositional standpoint, there was a shallow foreland basin and a shallow sea that was operative on the western side of the platform, and a tremendous <coughs> erg of sand, which was being blown from the Canadian Shield towards the northeast across the western side of this platformal domain. And that resulted in the deposition of, um, of carbonates and evaporites in the shallow evaporitic sea, coastal dunes and shoreline sands across the middle facies tract, and then finally continental sopkas on the west side. And, and the area that I'm going to talk about is right in here, in, in between the coastal dune sequences and the continental Savka domain. Ten sleep reservoirs are dominantly structural, structurally controlled. And here's a slice from the published literature from Teapot Dome, where you see a, a basement rooted fault propagation fold bringing up a very typical structural form, which is indicative of these sorts of structures all over. Uh, the region. Um, here's a, a reservoir quality plot from a, uh, an oil field just west of Casper showing the, uh, the high quality porosities and permeabilities, permeabilities up to a Darcy and Moore in areas of the Tensleep where drain flow and wind rippled packages um, dominate. 
Surprisingly, besides Teapot Dome and a few other cases, there have not been a lot of very modern structural studies done, at least published anyway, uh, of, the, of ten sleep reservoirs. This is a, um, a master's thesis that was done from Colorado School of Mines, which summarizes what is kind of the accepted dogma for many of these ten sleep structures in the subsurface, that there are regional systems of, uh, of fractures um, that are pervasive across the entire um, uh, area and then in the crest of these anticlines there are often concentrations of additional tectonic folding related fractures that do contribute to or complicate reservoir performance. Um, I'm sure some companies like Marathon who have really hung in these areas have detailed internal studies but just not a lot exists in the literature. All right, uh, zooming in again I'm going to talk about the Alcoba area and Alcoba it is a little town and a reservoir about an hour southwest of, of Casper, Wyoming. The Alcoba area sits on the Sweetwater Uplift, which is one of these Laramie structures, but it collapsed in late Cenozoic time. That, coupled with the fact that the North Platte River makes its way out of Colorado and through this area, has resulted in exhumation of this strip of country resulting in just fantastic outcrops of a range of geology from the Archean all the way up to the Oligocene. The structural form at Alcoba Reservoir is shown by this um, master's thesis work done at Alcoba Reservoir. And on the northeast side of the lake itself is this anticline called Alcoba Anticline. And I'm going to be talking about the anticline itself and where the tent sleep is exposed and then also the tent sleep again at the other end of the reservoir. From C to D, this cross-section here is a schematic version of that uh, published by the Wagesen that shows on the southwest side we're dipping uniformly off of another structural high. Then we get to the lake, it's kind of in the same climal position, then there's the fault of the anticline itself, and then there's the anticline. From a slightly larger structural perspective, if we now look at this cross-section that has that little thing that I just talked about, you can take that A to B and transpose it here in this scheme where the Alcoba area is on the back limb of one of these first order crustal structures that typify the Wyoming Laramide Foreland, like the Wind Rivers and Casper Arch, Bighorn Mountains, the Sweetwater Uplift was one of those scale of structures. In fact, it kind of connects with the Wind River Range to the west. Our anticline is on the back limb position of that larger structural framework. It's a second order structure, but it's of the appropriate size to be a direct oil field analog for the hundreds of structures in the subsurface that look just like it. So flying into the uh, airport uh, in Casper uh, from Denver, you'll often have this view out of the left-hand side of the airport. And if it's in the morning, it's a great time to get your camera. And here's what the anticline looks like. It's um, roughly 10 kilometers long as it's exposed at the surface, but it's much longer because it vanishes under young syntectonic rocks um, to the west. So at Alcoba, the, um, the outcrops are just really spectacular. Go there sometime, rent a boat from the marina, and tool around the lake if it's not a Saturday, and there are jet skis everywhere, don't do that. And it's just gorgeous. And here's a view of the anticline I'm going to talk about and looking about three miles across the lake to where these same rocks come back out of the water uh, again, where they're just gently tilted coming off of that larger uplift. And here's a, a bit of a close-up view. So that's all intensely exposed right there. So the, um, the story I'm going to tell really is a, kind of a, a compare and contrast of the tensely from one side of the reservoir where it is just gently tilted, and, and here it is on that side. This is called Fremont Canyon on that side. It's along the Platte River. Comparing the tent sleep there with what we see in the anticline three miles away on the, uh, on the other side. So I'm going to talk about fractures 
and how folding has sort of changed the tense leap and dominated the, the fracture characteristics. And I want to also want to talk about how the rocks have mechanically changed as a function of that folding. So we can compare the undeformed to the deformed as kind of a controlled experiment. And then these arrows represent places where large samples uh, were collected uh, that we used for our analysis. And um, we had the folks at Southwest Research collect those big blocks. And the story is that they rented, a, they bought a wheelbarrow to break these samples off and then take them down from the outcrop. And this is the reason why we couldn't get permission to go is driving a wheelbarrow off of this anticline with a 200 pound rock in it is pretty dangerous. And apparently they lost control of the wheelbarrow like right about there and ended up recovering it way down the anticline. So we didn't have to report that as an internal safety near miss, fortunately. If we're going to talk about um, diagenesis, especially involving quartz, we have to ask the question, what is maximum temperature? You know, I'm, I'm not a reservoir quality practitioner in any regard, but that's the first thing that they would say. What was the maximum temperature and how long did those rocks stay there at that temperature? Because that governs the degree of quartz cementation and reservoir degradation that might have occurred. So we haven't done any detailed petrographic work on fluid inclusions and other things. I've just reconstructed the geology to give us a rough answer. And my calculations suggest that the tense leap at Alcova, you know, followed this younger stratigraphy down in burial until it got to about 10,000 feet. And then, because it sits on the back limb of the Sweetwater uplift, it didn't continue down with more basinal domains it started its journey back up to the surface. And so that would have been right about the inception of Laramide tectonism. And so that gives us a maximum temperature with normal geothermal gradient, something in the order of 100 degrees C. Not real hot and not hot for very long. So that apparently makes a difference in considering what happens to the reservoir. So in its journey back up, it was folded and it was sheared and it was really turned into a very different kind of rock. And then finally, of course, along with all the Rockies, it experienced another kilometer or so of very young uplift in the late Cenozoic. OK, I'm going to review some of the fracture characterization work we've done uh, and do that pretty quickly. Um, Back in, I think, 2004, we commissioned a master's student who was generating this structure map to also acquire a LIDAR uh, data set across the cut of this anticline. This is a natural cut that the Platte River makes across there. And then using that LIDAR characterization, looking both ways, one side and the other, and I'll show you some more views of that in a minute, we First of all, built a, um, a structural model. And the structural model was turned into a GOCAD reservoir model. And, and here's the scale of that GOCAD reservoir model with some facies turned on, superimposed on top of a, of a structural model that represents this anticline. And then having the LIDAR data and the ability to rotate it and kind of look at its characteristics along the outcrop cuts gave us the ability, and this is you know nearly 10 years ago now, gave us the ability to characterize the fractures kind of uniformly at that scale of the LIDAR, which we did. And, and in that process, we generated these sorts of plots of fracture orientations and fracture densities and, 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 and such. Oh, here's a view of, um, of the LIDAR data itself on the workstation, and you can see that it, you know, it, it's bumpy because it's sticking in and out due to its erosional characteristics. And then rotating it around and looking at different views, creating artificial shadows, we were able to characterize fractures at different scales. And so that's sort of part of the, part of the process. And so here is an example of some of the fractures that were characterized that have heights that span this sort of stratigraphic range. And then if you zoom in 
To a finer scale, you can interpret yet another scale of fractures. And then Chris and I, in, in 2009, um, reported on that characterization work in APG paper, and some of these figures uh, came um, from that. And we reported the, the fracture intensities, you know, how many fractures there are for every meter that you, you look in a certain direction. And we, we, we considered what layers we were in, whether we were in the, the more finely fractured carbonates below or, or some of the more sparsely fractured aeolian dune sets above. And then we, we generated this idealized model. I mean, structural geologists love to make these things. I don't know. There must be 25 of these kinds of things in the literature. But here's one for this piece of rock in Alcoba. And it shows all of the tensely of the more marine-dominated dolomitic units below through to the 9 or 10 sequences of, um, of Aeolian packages above. And what we found um, are regional sets of fractures, like this one, that um, there's one swarm there, there's another swarm of fractures, and those fractures don't seem to care that they're on a local structure. They seem to be more regional in their development <coughs> than their extent. We also found that the intensity of fractures is very um, closely controlled by the thickness of the mechanical unit that hosts them. That's widely published in, in structural geology literature. And then we also found that in some units, there is a strong control of structural position, such as if you follow this unit, there are sparse fractures down the back limb, and as you follow it over the crest, it becomes very fractured as you go through the crest and then into the forelimb. So there are multiple controls on, on fracture intensities and fracture characteristics that, of course, we have to be cognizant of. And the, and the, the mechanical stratigraphy is a, certainly a key driver. So we took, we took a closer look at that. So just a little interlude here, and I'll use this outcrop of a sandstone channel in the Farron along the interstate uh, in Utah to talk about this. So in that same um, bulletin issue that that uh, last work was published in, um, Steve Laubach and John Olson and Michael Gross, Michael, raise your hand. There you are. Uh, they published um, a paper that I think is important to um, mention, and that's a paper where they advocated the use of what's called fracture stratigraphy. And um, you know, Michael can can check me on this, but the context is if we use the term fracture stratigraphy, we're indicating what the operative mechanical layering scheme was that controlled the characteristics of the fractures at the time of fracture. And that, that fracture stratigraphy might change as a function of geologic evolution. So mechanical stratigraphy is kind of a garbage term. And I think fracture stratigraphy is worth using when you're really trying to indicate the controlling mechanisms. So here in this sandstone channel, it's pretty cool. What you see is as the sandstone channel gets thinner and thinner and thinner, the spacing between the fractures gets finer and finer. So obviously there's a, there's a fracture stratigraphic control. But what's operative here is simply the, the thickness of this sandstone um, that is encased in more ductile units above and below, coals and shales. So what's presumably happening, I mean, I just took the picture of this. I haven't worked on this outcrop. But what's presumably happening is that there are joints forming in, these, in this sandstone channel, and those joints are opening mode. Um, parallel to the maximum stress, opening in the direction of the minimum stress, with a little bit of aperture each. And then those fractures die out upwards and down as they intersect some kind of um, material change, meaning that those joints or those fractures detach into those mechanical boundaries, the arrest layers, the fractures. That's the operative fracture stratigraphy. In this particular example, it seems like the fracture stratigraphy remained constant during the process. Easy. In our case, the fracture stratigraphy evolved with the folding. 
And this is not a new concept, it's just a really great example of the concept. So what we, uh, what we did, uh, Chris and I, with that GoCab model, is we asked the question of the model, if you are the entire tense leap, what is the intensity of fractures that cross you completely? In other words, over here in Fremont Canyon, where we see the entirety of the tense leap, and some really tall fractures, some places top to bottom. What that means is when those fractures or those joints were forming, those joints saw pretty much the entire tense leap as a continuous mechanical interval. So we do that here at the anticline. We see a couple of swarms of slightly higher fracture intensities where we think we see fractures top to bottom. But that's masked by a lot of superimposed fractures. If you ask the question then of the model, what is the intensity of fracturing that is confined to the largest pair sequence boundaries? And then you color, using the geo model, you color that by intensity. Here is the, um, the result. Well, there's a, some, a corridor, some higher intensity fractures here. But generally, as you get towards the crest and the forelimb, the color is warm and the fracture intensities get higher. If you ask the question then, the same thing, but now let's use bed or lithology bound discriminators, then the same thing happens again. You get another pattern of fractures that generally warm or get more intense towards the crest and the forelimb. And then we did it one last time, and that is to ask, and I didn't draw this in because it would just sort of vanish in line, so we asked the crossbed bound packages the same question. Where do those depositional elements seem to control fracture height? And in that case, then you see that these banding of different intensities show that that also has an impact on fracture intensity such as this fine scale interpretation here of the LIDAR. So this means a couple of things, to me anyway. One, trying to assess kind of a fracture characterization quantitatively, we're not going to be able to use any one single metric. And we're probably not even going to be able to use the concept of just mechanical stratigraphy by itself. We're going to have to marry a whole bunch of things, structural position and understanding the mechanics of the stratigraphy, but then we have, to, we have to put time into the equation. And that is, you know, these rocks went from being gently tilted to more strongly folded. And as that process was happening, the layer subdivisions that dominated the mechanics became more finely and finely subdivided as that folding process evolved such that in the end of that process, this anticline was requiring that even the four set boundaries, these things were structurally activated, not only for slip, like you know, flexural slip and folding models, but they were also activated as structural discontinuities that then helped to govern how the fractures themselves grew and arrested. So it's evolving fracture stratigraphy. And so what I would say, based on this example anyway, and others that I've seen in the field, and I know Michael would agree with that, or Steve, or other structural geologists here, that a question to ask is, when during the process do you want to know what governed the fracture formation? Because it's going to change as the structure ages or evolves. Okay, well that was the first half of the story um, about the fractures. Now we've taken it recently a step farther and started to look at the rock uh, itself a little bit. So I'll start off talking a little about the petrography and the paragenetic modeling that was done. Oh, here's one of these large slabs, by the way, a couple hundred pounds of this 10 sleeve sandstone sitting on a, a wooden pallet for scale. And um, Dick Larisse's work shows that all of our samples, and we've collected the four samples in the same bed to try to control for Lithology are all um, are all sub arcoses uh, shown in uh, in this diagram in the, in the bulk classification scheme sandstones and um, at each of our sampling locations I'm going to refer to them by their letters now there's the U for undeformed B for back limb F for forelimb and then C for crest and the reason why I chose it in that order is we're seeing a repetitive theme 
And that is lots of things seem to evolve as you go from the undeformed to the more deformed to the more and even the more. And here's an example of the local fracture intensities measured at each one of the sampling locations, undeformed and the ones from the anticline. And what we see is there are really no fractures at the in the undeformed area, you know, they're just too widely spaced to even characterize. You go to the back limb here, this spot, and we see that the fracture intensities have jumped up an order of five times to uh, 0.5 fracture per meter. You go from the back limb to the forelimb, from B to F, it um, increases by fivefold yet again, and then doubles once more in fracture intensity as you go to the crest. And so it seems like the crest, at least locally where we collected our samples, has the highest amount of local fracture development. Um, we did some uh, porosity and permeability tests to figure out what our rock uh, looks like. And this is where Jamie Jameson's inspiration that I mentioned at first comes into play. What we find is that the uh, reservoir quality, the porosity, and the permeability degrade from starting values of 20 and you know, nearly 100 millidarcies all the way down to very, well, for the tent sleep anyway, very poor reservoir qualities following that same kind of escalation scheme as the structure becomes more complex by location. And then taking those, that same data and plotting it against other compilations from the region, here's the uh, Port Hope Perm data from Oregon Basin up near Cody. You know, our undeformed sample seems to fit right in some of the higher quality reservoirs from that subsurface producing case. And then we fall off very quickly towards some of the, the, the poorer reservoir characteristics. Now this is this high porosity and permeability, eolian sand. Plotting it against the uh, coal and mullein South Casper Creek data, we don't quite get up to their highest qualities, the grain flow and the wind ripples, but soon enough we fall all the way down with our eolian sand into the non-reservoir inner dune characteristics that they plot for their data set. A few slides looking at the, uh, the petrography. Here is a, a view of, um, of the tent sleep from the undeformed and the back limb looks just like this. What we see is that um, there are some areas of a, a preserved matrix. The matrix is dolomitized. Probably free out of processes. There are preserved feldspar grains here and there. There's some replacive. Uh, dolomite and even some dolomite cements, but more importantly in comparing to the samples later, there's very minor compaction, just burial compaction, and the, only the slightest hint of quartz overgrowth cementation. We then jump, all, that was the undeformed in the back limb, so now we're going to jump to the forelimb, which is fairly strongly deformed. What we find out is that there is now extensive compaction. You can see that in the, in the close-up view. There are frequent gouge-bearing domains. This is what you'd expect in the forelimb of an anticline. There are commonly uh, fractured grains and extensive quartz overgrowth and also some calcite cementation. And we've come down from this position all the way down to that on the, the poro perm plot. And then finally the crest, which is turning out to be the, the, the most strongly deformed and altered. We have um, no preserved matrix anymore at all, extensive compaction and pressure solution. There is uh, quartz overgrowth cementation almost completely occluding the reservoir properties and we drop down uh, to, uh, to this position. And you can see some of the, uh, the quartz overgrowth cement around uh, this grain, for example. This grain interpenetrating that grain, fractured grains. Um, so I turn to Steve Laubach and his group at UT because this is what they specialize in is understanding fracturing and diagenesis and quartz among other topics. And uh, here is a um, 
uh, a panchromatic uh, SEM cathodal luminescence photograph. What we're seeing is this little area from a more conventional thin section view of one of these open fractures. And in this open fracture, there is um, a place where the fracture isn't open at this location, so there's preserved porosity. That's what this is, preserved porosity. And then right next to that preserved porosity is this crushed quartz grain with all of this quartz overgrowth. If you look closely, you can see some banding right here. It shows that as this fracture was opening, the quartz was also being deposited and the grains were crushing. And so that's an interesting circumstance that we have open mode fracturing and grain crushing and then of course the cementation happening all at the same time. It's very interesting from a geomechanical consideration. Uh, here's another view that they sent me more recently. It's a, uh, from their new color CL device. What I love about it is look at all of these fractured grains. Here's a one coarse grain which looks like it penetrated into this other one and cracking it and all of this um, quartz cementation that was happening which what really amounts to kind of a bridge of preserved grains and crushed grains along this fracture that was was either being preserved or perhaps operative. In some places these fractures have turned into um, to deformation bands or small faults where the, where the quartz grains have been just con completely crushed uh, into a, com a com comminuted zone. All right, so from the petrographic work, Anita presents this um, paragenetic sequence. And for the purpose of this talk, I think the points that I would emphasize, I mean, you'll recognize some of these things, I think, very typical in terms of, of quartz reservoir evolution, quartz sandstone reservoir evolution. But the, the things that are related to stress events, are shown by these green arrows. And there's, uh, there's compaction, chemical and mechanical compaction, which is a course of porosity uh, destructive element. Uh, soon after that process started, these other things happened as the, the system went into um, compression and uplift and shear. Um, here's where the grains are, are fracturing and the matrix, matrix it's, itself So that would be a um, matrix uh, enhancing process, um, and grain crushing, quartz overgrowth cement being a, um, a reservoir um, reducing process. All right. Then the last thing we've done is we've, we've taken these samples and we've done a very routine um, rock mechanics uh, testing suite of them. And I'll just show you two of these very busy, busy plots. The first one is our 10 sleep from the uh, undeformed sample. And what we saw was pretty well-behaved data, and the sample uh, ends up with a, uh, a Young's modulus of, uh, of 10 gigapascals. That's really pretty weak rock, you know, one or two um, million PSI. It failed at 130 uh, MPa, and it, it's a uniaxial compressive strength of 34, and then it's really quite weak in tension of only one MPa. So the point here is this rock is, is not really very strong, although it's this you know, beautiful Aeolian quartz sandstone. And when it fractured finally, losing all of its uh, ability to deform, uh, it lost cohesion completely, and the sample itself just pours um, grains out of the ends of the jacket. It became completely disaggregated. So compare that to the same bed, but now from the crest of the ancline. What we see is that Young's modulus is seven times higher. Well, that's just because it's this really well-cemented sandstone now. This is up on the order of, of nine or 10 million PSI. I mean, this is now a respectable rock. Uh, in terms of strength. Its breaking strength is twice as high. Its tensile strength is 10 times as high. 
UCS is high. I mean, this is, this is a completely different rock now as a function of this diagenetic process. So in just trying to report these, this laboratory data, um, made this slide. And what it shows in these four different panels is the same rock mechanics data. The stress at failure, uniaxial compressive strength, Young's modulus, um, gigapascals divided by 10, so I can get it on the same plot, uh, cohesion, tensile strength, and so on. And what we see is that all of these measures of rock strength are increasing as we go from the undeformed to the crest, and as our, uh, our deformation state becomes more advanced. Fracture intensities uh, increase. And so this is an odd thing. The local fracture intensity is increasing as the rock is becoming more and more cemented and it's becoming stronger and maybe it's becoming, I, mean, I hate to say it, but it's becoming more brittle as the deformation process evolves. And then here are the trends with, uh, with porosity and permeability. As the rock gets stronger and more cemented, of course, its reservoir characteristics are going to degrade. So what we're, what we're seeing, obviously, is that there is a chemo-mechanical evolution. We start off with the proto-lift of the undeformed, and then it is, um, it is transformed into this really new rock. And then even the sample, I forgot to mention this, you know, I, I said that when this sample broke, some of the sand grains just fell right out and completely lost cohesion. This sample, on the other hand, when it broke, it maintained its cohesion. It generated kind of a, a, a band of deformation that still had strength and didn't lose that ability to, to stay together. Very different mechanical response. Okay, so I'm going to start wrapping up. In conclusions, the mechanical stratigraphy of the tense fleet evolved during the deformation and it successively subdivided its mechanical thickness, promoting increased fracture intensity at finer and finer scales of layering. Its fracture stratigraphy was evolving. The uh, micro to macro deformational fabrics, the, the fracture intensities, the rock strength, they do vary uh, as a function of structural position, from the undeformed all the way up to the crest. Uh, the crest experienced the highest bulk strain and presumably the highest um, mean stress path and it resulted in that intense grain crushing and grain interpenetration, fracturing and local shear. The mean, the mean stress, the average stress environment of the crest of the anticline was taken into a much more extreme state. And then of course all that coarse cementation occurred. So to break this down qualitatively to what's happening in the reservoir, we, we have to divide it up between the fractures and the matrix and look at those independently, I would say. So in the fore limb, uh, let me start with the back limb. In the back limb, um, what uh, Anita and her petrographic work and her paragenetic model shows is that both the, the, the matrix and the fracture uplift occurred in kind of an improving direction as geology progressed. In these other two locations, especially the crest, the matrix properties just dove off a cliff. But at the same time, the rock was experiencing all of this fracturing and even dilatancy and the creation of fracture pore space and certainly fracture permeability was being created. And so those, those cross each other in terms of their, uh, in their directions. And so uh, I wonder how many of these examples in the subsurface follow this same sort of trend. Is this something that's unique to this anticline um, and surface exposures? Uh, I doubt it. Um, I think that reservoir performance characteristics in subsurface cases like this, you know, kind of need to, need to deal with this complexity, at least conceptually. All right, and then where we are right now is, um, is trying to 
assess if there's a way that, that we can make this predictive. We've made no progress on this. Um, I mean, a, a few models, but uh, we're really kind of open to figure out where to go. But what we have is we have, we have this scheme. We have um, our protolith that follows some kind of chemo-mechanical evolutionary path heading to our, our final structural product. And that path has a, a, has a stress history. This is mean stress and shear stress increasing in, as the structural deformation progresses, causing compaction, grain interpenetration, and fracturing, grain crushing. And as that's happening, there's dissolution at those grain-to-grain -grain contacts and all of that fracturing at the grain scale or the slightly larger fracture scale, that is creating brand new surface area all throughout the reservoir. Of course, that surface area, bristling with free energy, is a great place to re-cement all of that quartz that is now freshly being dissolved on this side. And that's resulting in cementation. And that's occurring with, uh, with temperature and time and presumably the, uh, the flux of, of fluids. And so this gets into an extremely complicated set of, uh, of conditions we kind of have to consider if we're going to hope to be predictive about this, about this process. But the outcrop is great to we can sample it, we might be able to model it, understand a little bit what's going on there. So um, working with Kevin Smart, We've done some preliminary models where we've um, used an elastoplastic um, rheology and a finite element modeling scheme, and we've we've tried to use what we've for intensely we've used our laboratory data, and then we've invented data for the rest of the stratigraphy that seems reasonable, and we built a layered model, and we forward modeled that until the, uh, the the geometries look similar to what we're seeing at the surface. That's really the only way we can check if the model is kind of geometrically working is just compare it to our, our subsurface, I mean our, our outcrop case. And then when you run the model, you can extract points of it to interrogate. So here are a couple of points in the back limb and the crest and the forelimb, and we're looking at uh, just the strain, the amount of, uh, of local deformation and change in length. Here's the strain that is um, is layer parallel strain in one direction and layer perpendicular strain in another. Um, these sorts of measures could perhaps be tied back to what we see at the, uh, the petrographic scale if we maybe took the time to characterize those petrographically. You cut oriented thin sections, you look at the amount of strain that you see at that scale, maybe we can relate that back to what some of these measures of strain are showing. That's that's a that's a lot of, um, of, of a PhD kind of, of work. We've also, Kevin has also analyzed the, the model by extracting it at the different evolutionary time steps. So here's the structural model, and in, the, in this three-dimensional plot, the back panel of the plot represents time zero, and then as the anticline forms, you move out of the plane of the, of the view, and here we have the final structure. And so that's the same thing that he's doing in looking at the cumulative plastic strain superimposed on the anticline or, or the mean stress. I really like this. I think the mean stress is a, is a, a great place to go or the, or the shear stress. Um, so this type of modeling, I think, um, can help us understand what the controls might be on kind of the model setup to understand if we're, we're really even replicating what these rocks might have experienced uh, in the subsurface. One thing we haven't done is, um, is to substitute in the properties that I've mentioned. I told you that the tensely changed as the deformation process continued. All we've done in these models thus far is put in our starting lithology taken from the underform. We could run the models and say, okay, at, at a certain stage of maturity in the model, we're going to replace that rheology with one of the more aged versions, like we got from the, from the forelimb or the crest, and run it that way. We can do that, and I, I think we should do that. Again, it's probably a PhD project. But then the question also becomes, what do we do about this evolving fracture stratigraphy? 
How do we handle the fact that these layers are becoming subsequently activated during folding? How do we deal with the fact that the rock is fracturing? And at the larger scale, the strength of the rock as it's fracturing is going to change and become much, much weaker. So at one scale, the hand sample scale, the rock's becoming stronger. At the larger scale, maybe just, just this size, it's becoming much weaker. You know, so how do we kind of wrap those two things together in terms of a forward modeling approach? So that's what I mean where we're trying to figure out where this work goes. Because I just, um, we don't know what directions we need to take. But, all right, um, I'm finished. So this is back to my original slide. And uh, I, uh, I thank you very much for your attentions and for the invite tonight. Now, we've, we've only looked at this uppermost um, Eolian package. So the story I'm telling you know, is, is just from that one bed. So that's clearly a limitation. We have done work using a Schmidt hammer. It's kind of a handheld device where you can assess maybe in a bulk sense the degree of, um, of cementation kind of across at water level. And we saw the same thing. So what, what I believe is that that distribution of, of cementation or the diagenetic change is happening more pervasively. There's one degree of it or a continuous degree back here and then as you move up more towards the crest you're kind of in another domain and you get to the foreland you might be in another domain. So I don't think it's patchy. I think that these, it's probably gradationally changed but it's pretty pervasive um, and using the Schmidt hammer is what kind of tells us that it's not, it's not patchy. In terms of your question of the, of the domains um, I think there's a lot of different ways I would answer it, so I'm not exactly sure what you meant by that, but this domain under my hand, for example, is just filled with sheared features, deformation bands, small faults, and so that constitutes a domain. This domain seems to have more just, um, just opening mode fractures and a few deformation bands here or there. And then this domain back here has just sparse fractures and, and one nice swarm that, that cuts through here. That's, that's this, this feature right, right there. So um, it seems to me like it's, it's very complicated, but it's not patchy. Systematic. Systematic, yep. Yeah. John? Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah, I'm not a structural geologist. But, you know, when I look at this, my question is, first, is the KVKH of the tendency pretty close to one? I mean, it, I guess where I'm going is, is this mechanical aspect of the folding create increased uh, uh, permeability to the rock to allow more fluids come Absolutely. Out? And, then, and then the second thing that was surprising to me is, is that mentally, I guess I always think of uh, Diagenesis occurring and starting in high pressures is dissolution in high pressure areas and reprecipitating in low pressure areas. But that didn't really seem like what you're seeing at all. You know that, which was real surprising. Okay. So the first point is, yeah, the the, 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 the fracture intensities are going really through the roof mm -hmm. in, in the main part of the crest of the anticline, and that, I mean, in the subsurface must have a huge impact on on performance characteristics. Um, enhancing performance character, or maybe making it really complicated for water floods or whatever, but... Um, uh, <laughs> Intuitively, that's where you would think you'd want to drill, uh, but obviously it's not. <laughs> well, it depends on what your goal is, you know, there's new structure and some oh, early quick production, oh, yeah, <laughs> but then you want to manage your water flood and not spend a lot of money circulating water, then it's probably a, a bigger enemy later on. Yep? It seems, based upon the correlation 
Would you, let me ask you a question. Would you assume that the local source and sync of ports is predominant versus yeah. long travel? That was John's question too, and I, I forgot your question, so I blew it off. But <laughs> there it is again. So, yeah, I, I don't know. We have to do some isotope work, I suppose, to do that. But I view it as having, as being local. That it's probably, maybe not traveling at all. It's, it's, it's dissolving from a point of, uh, of grain contact and then re-precipitating at the, at the closest uh, high free energy surface it can find. Um, yep, in the middle here, yes? Wonderful talk. Well, thank you. Um, couple of questions. One, did you try digitizing any of the crushed grains to see uh, how much material was possibly lost? Have done really none of that um, petrographic structural work, but it it's um, it'd be a great project for somebody to do that. Yeah, I mean I'd like to know a lot at that scale. I'd like to know. <laughs> well, this is hobby geology, so I can take up a collection maybe, and, but it's not an, an active project for us unfortunately. But um, you know, I'd like to know if you can measure the strain. You know, do the centers of the grains have they? been migrated in a sense that you can tell what the maximum, you know, a strain direction might be. So you, you do strain work, we could map the orientation of the microfractures and see if there's some systematics there. Maybe different orientations have different behaviors. I mean, there's a lot that, that could be done. So if, if I can add to that, and that's, I look forward to seeing your paper for sure. Uh, one. One additional factor might be that if there is a hydrocarbon charge in these reservoirs as the deformation was occurring, we know that the hydrocarbons were generated quite early and there were hydrocarbons in the system even before the structures were present. That hydrocarbon charge could help to dampen the um, the, the quartz cementation process. Yeah, it's one of the things we've been thinking about but haven't been able to it seems to me that so okay, but, so, but okay, just a second. But what I do think, though, is that it's also probably there is an underappreciation in the subsurface cases um, between the quality of the matrix and the uplift of the fractures. And I think a lot of the petrophysical data and a lot of the production data that we've been working with over the decades are kind of contaminated with a lot of fracture signal that may have otherwise been attributed to matrix signal. Not everywhere, but... And I'd like to just final comment for me, because I'll, I'll take this all night, but his model works very nicely on the teapot dome structure. You see it change from the, the back <laughs> limb to the crest to the front. It almost matches exactly what they're showing here. So resolving those issues that we've been talking about is kind of what we're driving at, and we haven't resolved them this year, because we've been looking at the seismic scale, trying to get it down to the petrophysical scale, but the analog seems to fit. It seems to have the same structure. It seems to have the same migration across the structure. One of the things that Tom Wilson kind of advocates is what's the orientation to the structure of the limb? Mm -hmm. How does it change? How does it change by any minor faults? And you actually see that at Teapot. So that's one of the things we've been trying to resolve. Well, I, think, I think you've got a marvelous story, but it's been a long time since I worked this area, but it seems to and I remember that when you get to the oil water contact, a lot of these reservoirs stop being reservoirs of the oil water contact. See, that's the, the how hydrocarbons may have yeah. mitigated. Yeah. So, I just have to resolve it. So, if, if, I mean that, if, if in fact the reservoir stops at the oil water contact, you've got a great story, but you've got one of your actors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I don't think the actor might be completely uh, missing. I just think it's going to be something that has to be factored in. I, but I, my guess is this is an extreme case. And we would find these same processes occurring uh, in the subsurface, teapot and all these other hundreds of examples. And I think if we look for it, we would see more and more of that, of that evidence. And so um, uh, I do, you know, with any outcrop characterization, you have to figure out where are you on the spectrum of reality. And I think in this case, we're, you know, we're pretty far out. I mean, this is nearly a metamorphic rock we've made. It's at, you know, uh, a quartzite um, as part of this process. But yeah, and what's interesting is if you go shallower into the shallower producing Cretaceous units, 
times. It's the same structural configuration on a lot of these structures. It's one big structural event, so it'll be, it's going to be interesting to try and tie that oil migration contact into the shallower units, which are definitely sourced by something else. But the fracture systems have the same orientation. So it's going to be really interesting to take it that far up. Wasn't there an experiment during plowshare in the 50s to set off an atomic bomb in, the, uh, in this? And <laughs> only more that, was, that was in Colorado at the Rural City. That's what you were in grad school, what that one? You got a very good, I was, I was laughing. Um, <laughs> good opportunity. There was a good opportunity then to see the behavior of the rock with varying uh, uh, overpressure uh, or very, uh, varying uh, pressures. And wasn't that greatly studied? You know, I don't, I have no idea about that. Uh, what I have heard anecdotally is they turned the well bore into glass. Yes. Then, Peter, do you, do you think strain rate plays at all a role in the successive subdivision of the fracture sets? I mean, let's say if I were to take take this example here to uh, another full thrust belt where the structure is formed in a much shorter time scale than this structure here, do you think you would skip a fracture set or two, or would you still follow the same succession? You know, I, 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 that's a great question. I don't even know how to go about testing that, though. Um, I guess the, the one thing that, that, that might be happening here is that the, um, the pace of core cementation compared to the, the rate of folding would be an interesting thing to investigate if there's some way to do that. And if the deformation were fast, there's no way the cementation could keep up with it. And so all sorts of uh, structural fabrics that might form might be different. That the pace of deformation are slow, and the and the cementation could keep pace. So, um, but I'm not I know I'm not a, a quartz cementation guy, uh, it, but it doesn't cement instantaneously. Yes. Um, so you've got um, you've got this extra cementation along the uh, the, the steep limb of the of the anticline. This is an enhanced sealing capacity with the uh, the, the, the cementation on the on that area that in the, on the seismic we would interpret as a fault and potentially a ceiling fault mm -hmm. to give you a longer accumulation down there where the on the on the back end of the of the structure where you've got you know a lot of uh, um, interstitial porosity and permeability. So in the seismic this would end up being interpreted as a as a ceiling fault that enhanced the ceiling capacity of the end. Yeah and especially if it had a a much faster seismic velocity and maybe some kind of a, you know a, a, a seismic fabric that you might misinterpret and you also right you might misinterpret this as being a fault just because the beds have gotten steep and so the ability to image those steeper dips you know becomes challenged anyway you diagnose they modify them a little bit and it becomes even more challenged yeah all of a sudden it starts to look like a fault and you might miss the overall geometry because of that yep absolutely Peter I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very